Welcome to Austin Lane Chain Users Group. Um, let me see. Welcome to our uh, August meeting. So uh, today we are going to start with a one-on-one -on -one session. Just a basic intro to what Lane Chain is. This is uh, targeted to if you're really, really new. So high-level concepts and a few high-level concepts, and then um, Ricky will walk you through getting. Let me camera on. Uh, Ricky will walk you through getting. Your first, uh, your first agent up in a simple notebook. So today we are going to uh, let me get all set up here. So Bear with me, technology. I got the sound back. Okay. Um, so welcome to Austin Lane Chain. We are a uh, uh, user group. We are so, user group uh, based in Austin, Texas, so Central Texas. We are organized as a public good. So everyone you're going to meet here, uh, while we all work for companies, um, we're all users of Lane Chain. Uh, we're all interested in AI technologies, and we've been coming together over this past year. Uh, once a month at minimum uh, for showcases and another time uh, about two weeks later out on town, right? Um, we meet uh, at two o'clock on Thursdays and Fridays for office hours and our community call. And our focus here is having a low stress, uh, fun environment for learning and sharing. Uh, one of the things that we say often is, you know, we're not trying to sell you anything. We're not trying to be experts on anything. What we're trying to do is find the other people who are learning together and learning to open together, whether it's the Light Chain project itself or the other projects kind of tie into it, like Light Chain is a little bit of an AI middleware. Everything's moving so fast that it's not like you can go to, to UT and take a class on Light Chain or even AAC City or even in a commercial partner. Um, you know, what, what happens is a new feature comes out, a new function comes out, a new, a new project connecting comes out. Um, and we try our best to figure it out. We, we hack it together. Some things we'll present on, we'll share it, and get, for, get feedback from each other. Um, the most important thing is uh, to have an open learning environment where we can learn, we can share, we can grow. Uh, we have uh, only two rules here, two simple rules. The first is be cool. What does two that mean? mean? Um, anytime you're learning, anytime I'm learning something new, when I go from expert to newbie, I feel like an idiot out the time, right? Uh, and, you know, all this, we kind of go back in that kindergarten brain. Uh, and we won't be cognizant of that. When someone's uh, showcasing, when someone's sharing, um, be cool to each other, be kind to each other, be supportive of each other, and set our egos aside and, and really kind of create that safe and comfortable learning environment and um, being supportive of it. We've had really great successes of that over the last year. Um, I've been really, really proud of each and every person uh, who's joining that. The second word is don't be gross. I don't have to explain what being gross is, right? Um, if anyone has a problem with you know, breaking rules one or two, they can come talk to me, they can come talk to Cream, Ricky, or anyone else. And again, this isn't a problem, but we do like to get it out there. So for those of us that are remote, you're already on sessions. For those of us that are local and right here, uh, you can pop on the QR code. We have a sessions interface. Uh, it's like a webinar interface. Inside of this interface, what do, what can you get? One, um, the sessions are immediately recorded. So if you saw something and you didn't like do didn't catch it, you didn't write a note, like, holy smokes, what is this? Right? Um, you can um, literally, I'm going to review it. Uh, you'll if you log on, if you create an account on there, you'll get an email to you. Um, if not, you can literally go to the URL that uh, you went to today and get a replay. It also, it has a full transcribed text act, a text on it, uh, so you'll be able to go through the transcriptions. Uh, right now, most of the microphones are coming through my laptop, so I might have my name on it. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's not me who's talking. I'm not the smart one here. Let me see. Uh, also inside of there, there's like Q and A. So if you have any questions, you can pop in the comment interface. Makes so people remote can access to it and see it. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Colin McNamara. Uh, I live on the east side, about a mile that way, uh, here in Austin. Uh, for work, uh, I am a managing partner for Eighth Generation Finance at a local consumer uh, consumer goods company uh, called Always Cool Brands. We basically, make uh, private label products for retailers, grocers, stuff like that. So, like formulation, packaging, supply chain stuff. My background uh, is in yes. There's a, a work. If you scan that, that'll give you the Wi-Fi information. You're welcome. Yeah, it's no worries. Let me see. Uh, my background, uh, I, I kind of call myself a reform manager. So I spent 15 years at Silicon Valley, moved here 10 years ago. Been a manager for about 13 years. Two years ago, I said, screw this. I want to go do fun stuff again. And so I, I've been learning Python, um, learning uh, AI, you know, learning light chain, learning how to be useful again. And so my background is hyper, hyperscale cloud engineering uh, prior to... Uh, starting always cool two years ago. Uh, I was a service owner at Commercial. I think I was the 301st employee at our cloud platform. And we built that to the fifth largest cloud in the world. Uh, ran networking globally for uh, that platform for optical engineering. And then um, 
globally for their Gen 1 and Gen 2. Um, I started using LangChain um, about a year ago. Um, actually, the impetus for starting this, uh, Harrison hosted a chat with data challenge, which was a basic RAG interface. And I decided, like a lazy engineer I am, um, to use that in my due diligence process of capturing away interviews from like manufacturer partner. Uh, long story short, it saved me from an SCC violation. That would fall out of my supply chain. Um, I was sold. And this was like pre zero dot one. Really shaky, all new things, scary, doesn't half work, right? Um, but that really drove me to uh, find people in my local community who are yeah, using this project, um, and that's with people like me, and, and learning this. Um, I'm available on a bunch of social stuff, all in Mac room, thanks on LinkedIn if y'all reach out. Yeah, uh, a little about LangChain, uh, the upstream project uh, that we work with here. Um, you can find if you, you find it at blog.langchain.dev. Uh, the LangChain team does a really good job of both creating content for their own releases inside of it, as well as taking uh, partner content of uh, people who like contribute, uh, contribute plugins, contribute code to the project. Uh, really, really great. Uh, it's founded by fellow named Harrison Chase. He's the CEO. And he's put together a really great team. Uh, one of the team members here, Eric, uh, I think you're from LangeChain team. Yeah. So welcome to the welcome to the club. So again, uh, LangeChain itself, there's a free Python library. So again, Python and TypeScript. Um, we focus mostly on the Python stuff here, but if you're a Java type person, love to love to have you contribute and add to the knowledge here. So, but a free Python library for those that don't use Python, it's kind of like the new Excel. Like it really is, right? It kind of is a new Excel. If you're going to business data, is data is value, data is oil, data is the driver of your business. If Python allows you to do a lot with your data, um, Lang LangChain as a project allows you to do a lot, a lot, a lot, right? And to really do some really, really interesting things, uh, three or four of which you're going to see in showcases today. Um, on top of the free library, there's some really interesting things that the team has put together. So uh, the team got funded by Squid. Uh, and so I got to make money as a company. Again, I work for another company. I am in the community. Um, but there's three things that have been really interesting. Uh, there's uh, Langraph Studio, which is a desktop IDE. Um, they got released um, within this past month. Uh, I've been using it to use some of the Langraph example code. Uh, specifically, the MemGPT use case for um, uh, basically memory enabled agents. Um, playing with this really, really, it's really, really cool. Ties into Docker, allows for easy development, port pull up, basically like two clicks, uh, a little URL we can plug your front ends into. Lang Smith is a troubleshooting tool, effectively. Um, you use for a thing called evaluation. So, why would you use Lang Smith? Uh, there's a web interface that uh, a, web, a web tool that you can basically put a little bit of code um, into your AI agents and they'll report up what's going wrong, right? What's going right, what's going wrong, get some non-functional test stuff. There's a lot of really great stuff inside of there, but for the one-on-one, that's kind of what you need to know about it. And then Langraph Cloud, which is a closed beta right now, which allows you to take your agent graphs so, um, and host them up into a hosted situation if you don't want to host it yourself. So this concept of graphs, you know, uh, a year ago when we were trying to figure out how to write AI code, you know, basically the LangChain libraries had just been released. Uh, it was a, a bunch of code that was being dropped in every week. Half the stuff didn't work. The docs weren't there. Things have been iterated since then, and they've evolved. So it started with very very Pythonic code, very programmer-centric code, where you had to have a deep understanding of what was going on inside the code. And then a, a update came, a thing called LangChain expression language, put an abstraction layer between the heavy, heavy Python code and being able to pipe, cool, uh, being able to basically pipe pipe chains together, pipe information together, whether that's bringing in um, a, like Nemo guardrails or bringing in something that will provide some sort of uh, controls to your agents or this piping your chains together to pass information back and forth. Recently, what's happened is that this notion of graphs, probably in the past three to four months, this notion of agent graphs have happened. So, Basically, what's happened is things have gotten a lot simpler. Now, the most basic of graphs that you have is a user interacts with like a supervisor. So each of these is an agent, maybe like a logical definition of a human or an AI assistant, right? Now, these agents, you define what are called nodes and edges. Now, you, put, you can put conditions in these edges. So basically, what you can do is you can define a team that supports you you can define the roles that each of the teams have, and you can define the tools that each of those members of the teams have access to, right? So every day as we're moving forward with this project and other projects like it, 
what's happening is the barriers to entry for a, a, a native technical person has been dropping every single day. And I think if we kind of flash forward, you know, three to four months, we're going to continue seeing this notion of software assistance, software, AI assistance, software development, which Ryan's going to showcase today, or business use cases of like uh, the financial analyst, uh, like Rob is going to show today, um, or you know other use cases. Uh, Kramer's going to show a very technical use case, um, but there's basically these use cases where we have absolutely the nuts and bolts of that, that highly technical programming of how agents and their tools map together. But more and more, we have this notion of a um, using prompt engineering to, in plain English, define what your virtual boy, your virtual assistant will do. So inside of each each of these agents, inside of these virtual assistants, you might say, there's a couple components inside. And if you're totally new to this, you don't have to think too hard about it. Well, it's important to understand what they are. So what are what, what do agents have? So one, they're like an independent entity, right? You can think of them like a person or employee, right? Inside of this agent, you have a couple of things. So one, it's access to tools. It might be uh, access like uh, this week I was playing with Tabili, which is an API. It's a tool that allows me to search the internet and it passes those search responses down in well-structured JSON. Um, other tools, it may have access to uh, like a GitHub tool uh, that allows you to interact with your GitHub repo, uh, which I think Ryan's going to show us a little bit about today. Access to your file system. Uh, those tools, you may define a tool that has access to a SQL server, right? So just like you, an employee would get access to a login to an interface, right? And you provision using rules based access control for that employee, you can do a very similar pattern with what they say this. Now, the agents themselves, what do they have? Like, what makes the brains work in these agents? Well, there's the large language model itself, right? And LM, it is a yeah. bunch map, a bunch map, but like a highly compressed version of maybe the internet maybe a, a version of something has been trained on, but it basically allows the agent to query, to pass information in, and the information back is most likely what that model's been trained on to repeat. Think about like a, a pair that's repeating act. Now, the other things that the agent has is memory, right? So the agent has now, basically the other, uh, semantic memory and episodic memory, so like short-term and long-term memory, right? And you can even connect memory between your agents together. So you can have like shared memory, memory between agents, or you can have kind of a state machine where they come together. The most important thing in, in, in your agents is the reasoning, right? So that's your prompt engineering. So you can in English, just like if you log into, you know, chat GPT, so you are a helpful, helpful AI agent that is good at know, accounting, right? And you give it some, you give it some guidance on what, what's, uh, what gap, like gap accounting is, and some examples of what good, good outputs and bad outputs are, you can preload these inside of your agent. So it has almost like a cognition, right? And then when you back out to maybe a more complex team, not only can inside of each of your agents, you can have cognition, but just the same way in an organizational model where you would define roles, responsibilities, um, leveling matrices, you would define run books. You can define a lot of this in your code. It is a really, really interesting uh, emerging space that I think we're all really lucky to play with. And I talked a little bit about Langsmith. Uh, it's a web interface for logging your AI, your AI, your um, AI workflows. Um, I was using it uh, this week to figure out. Um, I talked was going on. Um, I was playing with uh, using Claude to create a streamlit front end interface to interact with my agents to be able to uh, interact with the entry point into my graphs. And to be able to like uh, create and delete sessions and stuff like that, blocking wasn't exactly clear, but Langsmith actually was able to like, oh, this is exactly what's happening. Um, it even showed uh, there was an overload in the Cloud API because apparently everyone's leaving OpenAI right now. It's really, really cool. Um, it's really, really uh, powerful. There's a bunch of stuff that even I haven't gotten into yet. You can like, as you start moving between, um, say, swap into different LM of your agents, you can actually compare the evaluations. You can import data sets. I'm not the biggest, I'm not an expert on it, but I'm really enjoying it so far. Um, and then I talked a little about Langraph Studio. Um, this was a screenshot I was playing with this week. Um, it's free. I would really recommend downloading it. Um, I just took in the Langraph and GPT example code inside of a Langraph example and popped my environmental file in there, which had my keys, and booted on up. And I was able to, to interact with that agent uh, natively. Directly through the interface, I was able to interrupt the steps and communications between the agent 
And then I was actually able to build a web interface that connected, you know, just had to copy this, copy this URL, and I put that in the, the back end of my Screamlet code. Really, really cool. And, you know, I think we're really, really fortunate to have uh, the Blank Chain team uh, pushing things forward. And, you know, the, the whole goal of this is to uh, basically, uh, what's, what's the best way of putting it? Uh, Andrew, Ian, they were seeing angry. So he, um, he has deep learning at AI. He's done a lot of really cool work. Um, one of the best quotes that I've heard recently about AI development is that, you know, there's a lot of people that are scared that AI is going to change the world. It's going to break all, break everything. It's going to take everyone's jobs away, right? Um, and I really like the quote that you said recently was that it's not AI that's going to replace everyone. It's people who are building their sweet fleets of AI agents that are AI accelerated that are that much more efficient than everyone else who are going to replace everyone, right? So I'm really happy that you took the time to join us this morning for the first part of a one-one. Ricky's going to take the take the 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 important part here and get you started on your first agent. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Ricky. Third slash thing. Elmix. I top this. Third I'm share my screen right here. That third third slash. USB C for your. Okay. The IDDs to not all the relics. Okay. Well, man. I, I am unaware of any other operating system except Linux. Your virtual machine, oh, I mean, I don't know if you can run a Mac in a virtual machine right now. Well, it's, it's all over. Yeah. I know. You could run a virtual Mac on AWS at Mac. But, I mean, it's doing all the hoops. You got it. The Ricky, then got to do a super quick start. So we really just started to tell you the benefit of the IP on me. And now that I'm doing a real blast, you're not familiar with it. Um, it seems like most people that commonly made up are already familiar with um, OpenAI and, um, and uh, Google Lab. And if you don't know what Google Lab is, it's basically just a browser way of running the notebooks made available by like Google. So like all you got to do is have a Google account and uh, you can read the browser. Um, and, um, yeah. So I uh, started kind of guide you through um, how to go to OpenAI, get a, uh, make a do you want to show people, tell people how to get to the repo real quick? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, um, um, and, uh, wow. this is our uh, Austin Lightchain uh, repo and GitHub. Uh, we wow. have all our projects that we're working on here. Uh, we have our labs uh, and resources. The building just now, like building it, go keep wow. and, um, yeah, out. You can uh, you, you check out the earlier lab we did here um, in the in the lab, like directly. And um, um, got all the way through the wild time. Like the like earlier labs are more uh, kind of like guiding me through the basic, the deep screen lab, and using Doctor in the dot store, and then like some of the technical projects that we were done. So if you want to check it out, I would I would advise you to start with one of one and they wouldn't work your way up. Um, uh, some, uh, some of the code might be, I guess, old and it's well, like it's like changed it up the anywhere or a package. So um, sometimes you might still need to like import more into packages. You'll get errors that you're not importing something to just uh, be mindful of that. But the quick start will be on more resources. And beyond the quick start, we see it here, uh, like change quick start guy. And uh, if you got lost at this point, you can find the uh, repo. It's Google, Austin, Line Chain, GitHub. We find there and what. And then uh, research this. Thing. So, okay, so I, yeah, I yeah, just go to the website, out, be careful with your token, especially when you run the using it on the open source code uh, that just uh, chips out the eater. You'll like wake up the next day and you're like, man, I've got a hundred bucks on it. Look at us. Yeah. Yeah. Me or the person that stole my yeah, IP it was probably going to be, you know, but yeah, it's up. Okay. Yeah, I see that. And there's also like, which a lot of people are not as familiar with. And LinkedIn is basically the their ability layer of my chain. You use it to uh, to see the outputs of their events um, as you're running your AI apps uh, built on LightChain. And uh, it's actually quite easy to use. When LightChain um, was still pretty new, um, it was in beta and it was really free, but it since changed. So, um, you have to pay for it now, but if you want to use it, you can meet up with the company, the IP, and the quick start out of the week here. So, please, the whole team at the page, the weeks, let's you can go to sign up here, and then you can just opt out of the day, Google, get out of this. And it's a similar user interface as uh, with the AI, go on settings and adding their fire and their rules. 
then there's uh, Google Lab, and uh, Google and Lab is pretty awesome because um, it's it's really cool to make kind of just like throw together some example code, see tutorial, and then write it, write your code like block by block, and run it block by block. It's really useful for debugging and to show people like the steps that it takes to build a certain application. And uh, the very neat thing about it, the I like the most, is that you can throw your API keys on the sidebar right here. So if you were to change uh, the different notebook, your API key will still be in the sidebar. I mean, it, it don't go on anywhere, but it's actually do a little crap. And you never have to stuff. So to show you a uh, lengthening action, it's three on it, which is a it's Python way of doing fun end. Uh, now, I think there's other frameworks around there, but this is kind of what most widely about one that I've seen. And uh, we, our 101 actually has a lot of the tutorials that got you from pretty well. Through all the very big dumb about brain. Um, and the neat part about the green one is that you can write an entire chat bot with just 41 lines of code. So, um, by the way, Google Lab also has a um, extension you can get. Oh, so you can uh, just click on that and uh, you're and you get to do the, the phone with extension. And it should, yeah, it's just stay tuned to Google Lab thing if you're at. Uh, we, we do have buttons that are uh, thrown out markdown in that you know, the notebooks. So you can, uh, in the set that the button there, and it should say you the lab, the lab there. You know. So uh, let me give you a little taste of running your own agent. Go so, uh, here in the lab. I'm running a 101, uh, one during the stream on the thing. Uh, and then I modified this a little bit for me because this notebook has a, as a sidebar would get clear up in your API. And then every time you got these, I always expose my keys. Just, uh, so yeah, you would, you just go block by block. You can go to, uh, run sign right here and slide all. I don't need this a little bit of time uh, to download the good packages here. But then you can throw these blocks like that. Uh, streamlit app, uh, say into the spiral, and then this actually certain the streamlit app, and uh, this this block just gets set up your uh, the IP address, like the uh, instance of your um, your Google app server, and uh, we're doing that, so you're doing the next block, which actually serves your application to the internet in a local time multi and yeah, it's kind of gives you like a temporary URL that you need to serve whatever you want. It's not a neat way of um, serving. Uh, so, uh, third day black can be that. There you go. And, um, our notebook has the sidebar I will mention, which would be your API key there. Yeah. And that, and that would question one. I like to ask this question. There you go. Deep. And, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it for the quick start. Awesome. Thank you, Ricky. Okay. Release your, uh, share. Anyway, I will share my screen for a moment. Our screen. And grab the uh, thing, thing back for me. Your, uh, no, that's here. So everyone can see us. Hey, Ryan, can you click this on your shirt? Thanks for next word. Okay. Again, um, I think most of you all are in the room. So let's get to it. Uh, so our agenda today, uh, we just finished the one one quick start. Thanks, Ricky, for going through both creating that guide um, and uh, going through it. You know, it's really important to me. And I think he, everyone, a lot of people have demonstrated, it's really important that we kind of embrace this experiment of what can happen if we put these technical skills into our community, uh, both here in Central Texas, but abroad. And, you know, whether it's, you know, we've had everyone from ranchers to rocket scientists in this room. Uh, and, and it is really, really good. Uh, makes me really thankful to see the work that you and everyone else have been contributing to this. Oh, thank you. Okay. So uh, we're going to just a simple welcome message, which most of you already heard. News and announcements. And most importantly, it's Ox and Labs. Rick here already gave the one one quick start. Uh, after that, we're going to go into showcases, and that is going to start with our CodeGen showcase, and then a tool colon showcase, and then a force court showcase. Okay, uh, we already went through this. If you have, if you weren't in the room, you can click this, uh, click on this QR code. It'll take us take you to the Git our GitHub, uh, which has links. Uh, we have about 150 people, I think, on our on our Discord right now. Usually, about 30 of which are active at any one time. It, it's, it's busy enough to stay interesting, but not overwhelming. Uh, sometimes Discord gets really overwhelming for me. Um, we post our stuff onto Meetup. Uh, so both our in-person event, our showcases, then uh, usually two weeks after showcase, we, we end up uh, out on town at a, a local bar um, with uh, some of us bring our laptops, work on labs, other just hang out. 
Um, we call it our hacky hour. Um, the next one is at Skinny's Off Track on 12th Street, which uh, is pretty cool. $2 pints. What's that? Oh, damn. Yeah, it's good. And let me see. And then uh, we meet uh, on our Discord. We meet at 2 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Office hours at 2 o'clock on Discord. It's open discussion. And then on Thursdays, the first half of that uh, slot, we you know go through the, the administrative things of uh, doing community call, of how we plan these events. If you want to join in or contribute, Please join. They're all both open. Um, and then we drop into office hours. Uh, I find it's a great way for me and uh, feedback from others of just keeping up with all the, all the things that are keeping up with. And it's been a really great. I think our, our last community call, Kevin, we had like nine people on, um, which is great. Like it, it's not annoyingly large, but it's large enough to be interesting. Okay. And you know, I mentioned to others, we, we learn in the open here. Uh, for those that weren't in for the one on one, this is not about. Uh, anyone proving how smart they are. This isn't about, you know, kind of the nerd talk down thing that can happen a lot of things. Uh, this is about sharing what we're learning, showcasing, being positive to each other, supporting each other. Um, it is really, really important. Uh, we're learning, we're connecting uh, with other early adopters. Two roles, uh, be cool, don't be gross, be cool to each other, you know, that respect each other that we're, we're new and we're learning. Um, no matter where we come from, technically, we're all new when we're doing stuff. And then, don't be gross. We know what that means. I want to take the time to thank our supporters. Uh, Lynx Ventures uh, has uh, provided us with a space today, which is beautiful. Um, I, I love this space. The 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 the, the co working space. It's a law firm. Um, the patio. It's been really really great. Uh, I want to thank my partners at Always Cool Brands uh, for supporting us. And um, then Charles is here. Uh, Jocko Games also uh, contributed beverages too. And then um, most importantly, I want to uh, thank our contributors to our Canada content, our community, and uh, to our people have been diving in for video production, which has been amazing. Um, audio stopped, Cameron said. Okay. So uh, let me see. Uh, for people that are interested in showcasing, click on the QR code that goes to our Discord. Reach out to me on Discord. Reach out in the showcases forum. Um, the whole point on us is to be able to amplify what people are doing. So please, we encourage uh, everyone to show us what you're doing. Uh, next, for video production, a little update. We're, we, we finally have enough videos cut up to start uh, processing them and putting them back on our, our YouTube channel again. Uh, I want to thank everyone who's contributed to the effort. We still got a couple more to, to catch up on and go, but I, I feel like we're crossing the finish line. Uh, and I'll... And now being able to start experimenting with, you know, using the AI tools to uh, go ahead and uh, parse these videos, uh, create create the, the, thank you, create the socials content and all that. But, you know, it's kind of have fun at it. Uh, so again, if you are interested in helping with uh, video production and, and AI content stuff, like, please jump in. Um, we got a decent amount of people helping out. So there's always an opportunity to give back. Okay, what's going on news-wise? So we talk about office hours, talk about our community call. Talk about our hacky hour. We talk about showcases. Um, the big news is uh, we got approval through uh, the community college. And Charles, thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, I'm, I'm. Charles is kind of like one of those guys that one of those people in Austin that one knows everyone, and I figure gets a gets a lot of positive energy from like connecting people and creating a vibe. And he's a really awesome dude. He's been really critical in anything we've been able to accomplish here. Um, and so Charles uh, connected me with Brian over at, at Austin Community College. So we now have a space that can hit fit up to 260 people. And that is, again, free. So we run this all, almost $0. Um, so our next one, um, I'll get it confirmed. I was just out there this week. It is a beautiful space. And it's like two or three blocks that way. I completely turned around. I, I lived in 11th and West for seven years. I should know. So it's at 12th and West. It is the original Austin High School, and the space is actually in the uh, original gym for original Austin High School. Uh, it's very historic. Uh, the first high school in Texas, I believe. Yeah, totally. So on that note, um, and if y'all need like AI news and stuff like that, um, there's plenty of that on YouTube. Um, but and if I and, and if people want more AI news or in our things here, like tell me and we'll go ahead and add it in. But I think it's most important that we get to showcases right now. So let's. Kicking on over to Ryan, who is going to give us a little talk. Not a little talk. He's going to showcase and show who is code with AI. Now, I mean, that connected into, you know, the beliefs, right? 
find them with the screen share selection button. I'm right back in. Sorry, but I haven't been able to shoot it. The other, while Ryan's doing that, the other really cool thing is that ASUS is contributing uh, video production. Yeah, I'm which I'm extraordinarily excited about. So maybe I have to lug around less less gear and play like ghetto cameraman. Yeah. Students, oddly enough. Yeah, yeah. So they get to learn how to do stuff. And yeah, it means spicy. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. You know, it's also, it's it's an interesting, I'm going to fill time here as Ryan uh Figure some stuff out. It is a it's a really interesting use case where Sim Center really recognizes the public good. That's, That's your video. video. So this is your face, Ryan. Yep, I'm in. Okay, and then you should be able to share. So, um, wait up. There's Kirby. All right, all right. Get that pulled up. Here we go. go. Uh, let me make sure. I'm like muted. And stuff. There we go. That's what we're after. All right. It's got this is no, it's, you can plug in the projector to my projector as well, right? They should make the next year. Thank you, sir. Yep. All right. Um, so my name is Ryan Booth. I work in network infrastructure for Juniper Networks right now. Uh, primary focus has been software development around data center automation and working within the organization to optimize any type of DevOps or um, software development workflows. And over the past year or so, I've been doing a lot of exploratory research on how we can actually improve um, workflows with inside the engineering organization. And so that's kind of why I, I landed here, um, kind of walking through a, a larger project and step on, you know, getting some sort of code generation pipeline built um, that we could possibly use. So uh, a quick overview of the whole thing. I'm, today, I'm just going to be covering um, the GitHub integration with LangChain um, just because of its power and how much it actually adds um, to the effort um, with minimal investment from my part. Um, but overall, the project, essentially, um, my thought process coming into it was engineering teams are always shorthanded. There's, there's never enough key talent. The ramp up of new engineers is slow. It takes a long time. And then you always have a massive backlog. You always have a massive amount of technical debt. And you always have way too many feature requests being pushed in for by product. So it's a matter of how much can we find and how much can we handle just like we always have been with DevOps practices and, and, and utilize efficiently. One of the key pieces that comes over the past couple of years with transformer models is the ability to actually get um, an agent or get an LLM to generate code for you. Um, and so it's now take that and it's going beyond just, you know, using, using chat GTP or, um, long long or any of the models you want to, to just be a, a stack exchange version to ask a question, get a result, copy and paste and dump it into your code base. Um, we don't want that because you're, you're missing a lot of components that go with that. What about any of your integration tests? What about any code review, any linting? All of the process that happens in your, your dev pipelines needs to be taken into account. And so when I originally started going down this path, I had started out with um, multiple different frameworks. The, the first one I touched on was Autogen because I really liked the supervisor model of Autogen. And that's what Colin kind of um, explained earlier with the, with the um, lane graph is how the supervisor model worked. And so looking through this, the... The, the thought process and, and how I'm organizing and, and walking through it is, is you, you would handle an agent or you would handle a group of agents the same way you would a team. Um, you wouldn't expect an, an entry-level junior engineer to be able to handle larger complex issues, but they could get a long way through it. Maybe an 80-20 rule. 80% good, 20% we need to work on. But so... We should treat the models, in my opinion, the same way that we treat our employees. We trust, but we verify. And so that's the model that I think is, is a strong starting approach with the code generation pipeline is every single step needs to be broken down or combined into an agent to be able to con um, control outcomes before it moves on and goes through gatekeepers through the process. 
So hopefully I'll be presenting more on this project over the months as I keep working on it. But a quick start with this one is just the GitHub integration. So earlier this year, when I really started working on this and I didn't have a ton of cycles to put into it, so it wasn't like 40, 60 hours a week type work. Um, I started off with, okay, I, I, I want to just do base integrations um, using tools. And it sounds like someone else is covering tools after this. Using tools to integrate with GitHub or integrate with our Bitbucket to, to take code and push it in. Um, one of the first things I don't want to do is just have a chat interface where you copy code out and dump it into your terminal. Um, that's kind of like how we used to share files in the old days before repositories came out. That uh, just ain't cool. So um, the, the notion is we need to build these integrations and how reliable can these integrations be? And so as I was venturing down that path with tools, um, it was nice that they have the option to, to not be 100% controlled. You can give um, dynamic schemas to how it's supposed to interact with the tools. I am getting a little ahead of myself, so I'll try to cut that off. But it was becoming very, very difficult um, and time-consuming to build integrations. Um, a very simple, just, I, I want to generate some code and then have it push, push to GitHub gist, um, which I did get that working with, with tools. That was a solid two weeks of just hacking around, trying to figure out how to make it happen. Um, now, I'm not the strongest software developer out there, but it took a while. Um, and then just the other month when I, or just last week, um, beginning of last week, if not the week before, um, I was introduced to the GitHub integration of Langchain, which is what we're seeing on the screen here. And in a matter of like two hours, I was able to have an entire GitHub workflow automated inside Langchain. And that's what I'm going to show here. This is a pretty damn powerful um, integration. Um, it brings us a lot closer to integrating AI with our DevOps environments or DevOps or developer workflows, however you want to go about it. So here's the GitHub integration. Um, before I jump into that, anybody got any questions, comments, bring anything up? What was the purpose of storing them in just... Um, take the easiest approach with the least amount of effort. I figured I could just copy and paste some code into a gist body and dump it on there. It was it was pure laziness. Okay. So well, what you got now is better. Yes. Okay. All right. My right. So your end games. Yes. Only I request the feature add gets assessed so whether it's reasonable or not. So essentially, tired with that generate unit to push. Made it entirely AI numbers. Maybe we're stuck with checks. Yes. Okay. It, is that kind of way? Long term moonshot end goal would be that. As, as I develop the story and I have this conversation more and more, the, my, my thought process goes we want to follow the same workflow we do with an engineering. Um, we just want to integrate LLMs and strategic places in that workflow to take over. So I, I, a, a walk, crawl, run method that I can think about is you start off and do just basic create, take issues, take technical debt, smaller stuff that can easily be tagged as let AI work on this. And once it gets dumped off, a workflow picks it up. And this is what I'm going to show. It picks up a ticket. It picks up a, a, a bug. Whatever it is, it takes what's in there. It interprets it, summarizes it, generates the code, and dumps it into a PR. Once it's dumped into a PR at a beginning stage, then it follows the same process as a human would. Okay. Um, now, how to have it follow up and stuff like that, I haven't made it that far. It doesn't even have to be followed up by AI. Maybe AI does all the troubleshooting for you, gives recommendation, and then someone could pick that up. Um, Endless bits in the features problems never big time to follow up. Exactly. exactly. We tribute. Yep. Piece the app. The time to get exactly I can 100% of the but in you like tested or everyone did and they make that decision push well and that features in there right if I take it I have this yeah and two hours later as a user the feature I asked for is now looking to play to yeah and in, in a in a I, ideal world yes that's where we want to get to yeah, and, you know, um, yeah. Time, right? but, and it, it, it is one of those. So there, there, there's a number of concerns with all of this. Um, and that's why I'm liking the, the agent workflows is because you can chunk up the, the tokens that get dumped in because 
the first problem that most real code bases have is they're just way too large to just dump in context windows. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. And it doesn't make sense to, it just doesn't come out right even when you can get it in there. And so being able to step through it, break it down, and get through each step and validate helps with that process. So One other thing I wouldn't mention about that, like to the point where you got a large code base, you might have a front end that's built on JavaScript. Maybe it's React application. You got a back end that's written in Go. And to provide all that context, right? For, hey, here's my back end. Here's my front end. I'm trying to make these two interactions take place over this API. The problem is that sometimes your front end application developers have their own styling structure and consistencies that they're expecting. When you start dumping everything into these context windows, you're going to lose all of that styling, all that consistency. So what you're going to get back, the quality of that code is not going to align with what you develop or what you maintain on a database. And I'm really excited to see you solve all my problems. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> GP team stand will be the one you play tick buttons. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> and and that's but between so style guides, documentation, a lot of stuff like that. That's you know, the the tool workflows or one of the other areas on a on a other project that I've been working on. And now I'm getting off the beaten path, is is actually building tools that interact with an API just based off API specs or just based off documentation. So the wh where I'm getting at is I have one chain that's essentially what is the first week of a software developer's job? What are all the docs? What are all the guides they got to read? What are all the requirements? All of that. Dump that into a chain, build that in so that those documents can then be passed into the next chain so that the, the AI agents adhere to the company practices for software development. Hopefully, but long ways down the road. So the GitHub integration, um, basically the GitHub integration is a wrapper around the PyGitHub library, um, which I am not familiar with at all. I've never used anything with um, GitHub integration like this. So completely new to me. And essentially what it does is it, it, it provides a wrapper around that where an agent can pass in the, the proper parameters um, the, the proper information from what it gathers to then push that into GitHub to do whatever you want. So it understands the API endpoints that need to be hit to create an issue. And so it knows, okay, this is a summary message that the user gave. Let's put this in the body. We want to give it this type of title and do all this. Or if you're getting more detailed into to what you're um, trying to integrate and push into GitHub, it, it, it helps smooth the process out so you don't have to statically define everything. Um, and from from my perspective with that, I know I'm adding a lot of my own color, so I apologize. If you do disagree or you have more color around it, feel free to correct me. Um, I'm here learning just as much as well, too. One of the things that I, I really feel with AI workflows um, that we, we got to keep in mind is we don't want to just statically define their process through life. Um, they, you can write code to do that. And that's nothing new. We've been doing that for a while. But where can a model or an LLM fit in to, to fill out those areas that a human will? So the GitHub integration with LangChain is basically a, a simple package you pull in. Um, and it's also part of the community um, is the community the right word? It's part of the community contributions from GitHub. And so essentially what you can do with this within LangChain is you can basically inter interact with anything that you can interact with through, through the Pi GitHub library. Um, this page here, I'm going to go ahead and drop that in the chat for everybody. Oh. I'll have to do that in a minute. <laughs> Never mind. Yikes. Yeah. So... To, to really get started with this, I'll kind of walk through a couple couple key things here, and then we'll jump into what I have as a demo and walk through some live code. So set up, th this guide is really good. It's nice and complete. Um, as a very first step, I suggest just walk through this step by step exactly how they do it. Um, I did find out the hard way that once you kind of start adding variables or tweaking how things are done or I'm going to use GPT-4.0 instead of the 3.5 that it suggests. 
it, it, it kind of starts going to hell. So, you know, to get to get your feet underneath you, walk through this guide step by step, you see how everything works and then adapt is kind of my recommendation or that's the approach I had to take. So first things first, you know, it, you obviously got to allow authorization into GitHub. Um, it uses a standard app ID, private key setup. So you got to add those variables. You got to set them up on your repository. Um, this step, take a little bit of time setting up. Uh, make sure you get it right or things kind of get weird and troubleshooting gets really hard. So make sure you got this step nailed down. And then basically it's as simple as importing the agents, um, importing the tools and going to town. So the key is under lane chain community, there is GitHub under toolkits and under utilities, um, GitHub, GitHub API wrapper. So the GitHub toolkit and the GitHub API wrapper, those are the key key tools here of integration. So um, you set up a few variables. You got you to tell it, you know, um, what repo it needs to care about. Basic stuff like when you create a branch, what, what should the branch name be? And then what is the, the default branch or the base branch, the main branch, whatever you want to call it. And after you get there, you pull in whatever. Um, if you're open AI, you got to pull in your key or whatever models, you got to get those set up with authentication. Simple agent setup, you basically define inside lane chain what your LLM is. Um, this is chat GTP. Um, this one is GTPT4. This must have been changed recently. I swear that was three um, a little while ago. Anyways, you set up your model, um, and then you you authenticate and you instantiate the, the GitHub API wrapper and then the GitHub toolkit. Um, and that will allow you to then turn around and get every tool that you care to use. In the example, and then the one that I use as well, to keep it simple, it's just pulling in all tools. Um, you can filter out your tools. And then the, the approach that I'm looking to take is each individual agent will have its own set of tools. Um, that it's allowed to pull from GitHub. So if it's a planner agent, you're not going to be able to push a PR. Um, but if you're a tester, you're going to be able to run GitHub Actions and tests. But an engineer isn't going to be able to build packages, whatever the workflow is. So that's where you can come in here. You can pull in the tools, and then you can filter out the ones per agent, or you can use it here and filter it out. You then set up your agent in LangChain like you normally would pointing it towards the tools as your tools, um, which tools will get talked about in a little bit more time. And then from here, what you can see is they just do a simple print of each of the tools available. And so here's a list of them all. Get issue, get issues. Wait, that's reversed. Comments, read files, all these fun tools that, that it can work with. And the nice thing is, is you don't have to build this tool. You don't have to build the API calls. You don't have to build the library. You don't have to build all that stuff. It just handles this. And then you basically execute it and run it. And what it'll do is it'll turn around and it'll walk through the workflow. So that is the base concept here. Under lane chain, so it is, since it is open source, the whole project and all of the, all of the wrappers and stuff can also be found in the GitHub repo. Um, and along with the documentation on everything with it as well. So um, that is one of the areas that I was hoping to do before the meeting was really dig into the code and see how it's architected to talk about, but I didn't get to. Um, so I'll leave that one for homework. So yeah, let's jump into this. Um, any questions while I transition? Comments? Complaints? You're doing great. All right. All right. So... A little over a year ago, one weekend, I got the wild hair up my ass to just take chat GTP and build out a full Flask a or fast API project. Front end, back end, ran on Docker containers, a whole nine yards, and chat GPT built the whole thing. Um, it was kind of one of those um, just exploratory learn, really where I could push chat GTP, nothing special. But this project's now going to be my guinea pig that we're going to test against. And so, yeah, here's what we got. So I got main branch. Um, it only has a single branch, but we have a single issue. And inside this issue, it wouldn't technically be an issue, but it's more like a feature. So we have someone coming in asking to add filter options to the Git parameter. Okay, so yeah, let's do that. So essentially in this ticket, this software developer who happens to also be me, basically laid that out and then also was helpful enough to give us what the code looks like right now as 
as a ticket. And this is one of those where as, as I go deeper in the workflow is, is how, how this process happens or does a product manager with features dump that into a ticket that, that gets pulled in um, or, or how it plays out and how much detail gets added here. That's, that's an ongoing discussion. But here's what we have. Um, this is also issue number one. Since it's number one, I guess nobody's been using this whatsoever. So we're golden. So that is our um, issue that we're going to work off of. And let's see, hopefully, yes. Okay, here is our script. So I abstracted this out of the larger project. I didn't want to, but the larger project, and I'm still in the middle of making a few things work, looked really hairy and bad. And I didn't want to do that to everyone. I didn't want y'all have to suffer through the hacky code I had going on. So I cleaned it up. Okay, so this is just running independent on its own outside of the project, but it'll do the same thing. So simply what we're doing is we load our dot in, um, our environment file with all our variables. Um, and then we set, um, next right here, we set basically a number of variables and properties that we care to use. So inside of a workflow, you know, we're statically defining we're working issue one. This would either come from user input or it'd be picked up from another workflow another way. But Right now, we're going to do it simple because we only have one issue in existence. So fix it. Um, the repo, we point to it ourselves. That's the repo we're working off of. And then when we create, when this bot creates a branch, what do we want the branch to be called? And so that's what we're doing here is naming it um, CodeGen bot test and then the repo for the issue number that it worked. And then what, what branch are you basing this off of? And it's going to be main here. Um, our API keys, our LangChain and LangSmith stuff is there. I have absolutely no idea what this one does, if someone could tell me. I just dumped it in there when I was trying to get this working and I never took it out. But yeah, um, so LangSmith is going on as well. Let's see. So essentially what we did in the guide, we, we set up the LLM. I'm going to use GPT-4.0 just to keep it simple. I'm going to instantiate um, GitHub and the toolkit, and then I am setting up, um, I'm pulling in all tools, and I'm doing the same print function just to show that I have access to all those tools as well. Um, and then something to help with the process and help with the documentation is actually formatting um, the output and formatting the structure of what gets passed between agents or what function calling happens. Um, and so I, I have just a very simple format issues function um, that takes the issue that's pulled back from GitHub. So we pull in the issue right here. Um, so this is basically with the API wrapper to, to pull in GitHub, the GitHub issue, and then dump it into this format. And then we pass all of that into our prompt. And so here's the only prompt. Wait, only? Can I say that? I think it's our only prompt. Okay. Yep. Single prompt. Okay, so you're an experienced software engineer that creates pull requests based on GitHub issues. Given the following GitHub issues, passing in the entire issue as a formatted payload. Whoops, sorry, it looks like that. Am I going too fast for anybody? Everybody's there? Okay, am I going too slow for anybody? All right, so we then turn around and we lay out exactly what workflow we want. So what I wanted to do is I want you to understand the issue. I want you to summarize the issue and then write the code, and then any existing tests that need to go along with it that need to be updated, or any new tests that need to be created because it's an issue. There's probably not a test. Um, and then turn around, create the pull request, and then link to the issue. Simple workflow. That's what we have here for this chain. We then pass that into, we build a prompt template that can be passed into OpenAI. And we see that we pass in. So when you're doing a prompt template, that's what generates this. If you're used to Jinja, it's basically the same thing. You're passing in your input variables, and that's where they're being defined there. So if we had more, um, then we could turn around and pass those in as well. And then we turn around and we format it and pass in the entire issue. And so what, <clears throat> what will happen, let me see. So that is, is that supervisor? Bill. So I'm passing in a summarizer LLM um, to basically handle the conversation, summarize the conversation and dump it into a memory bank. So essentially when you're working through an entire chain um, of multiple chains 
you you can have that shared buffer memory to to actually show the conversation. People can see what steps, or not people, but agents can see what steps have been taken. So that's where we're setting up a memory buffer, and then we initiate our agent. And so I'm I'm using the older style initialize agents because I was having a lot of trouble getting um, the newer styles to work in a couple ways. So I stuck with this. Um, we're setting up a simple agent. And then you can see that we pass in tools as our tools. Um, the LLM that we defined, we're passing that in as our LLM. Most all the rest of this is pretty default or copy and paste from somewhere. And then we also, in inside our memory prompts, we have our chat history. And then we have our final prompt that also goes into the memory as well. And then we turn around and run it. So with tracing V2 enabled, I believe that's a link sniff thing. Um, we turn around and we kick this off as agent run and with the final prompt. And so that's what we will see. Now, when I ran this about two hours ago, it took about two full minutes to run. It was crazy slow. Um, so let's see how this goes. And so we're going to get our um, warning. There is all of the available tools to us that I said we would print out. And so it is the same tools, some um, deprecation warning, and then it's going to take off. So what we're looking to see is when we come back in to our repo, we will start seeing a pull request pop up. And then hopefully the ticket as well will get linked back. But I have had problems with that one not happening. So, so right there in your issue, you had mentioned that you passed in the user had passed in the function. This is more of a kind of trying to reinforce, Hey, I want you to focus on this section of the, of the source code. I think so, that's why I did it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was kind of curious, Rex, if you don't give it to someone, it's it stay out of the C. Yep. It, okay. it, it straight up just doesn't even use it. Uh, we'll, we'll see in the Langsmith trace. And then we'll also see in the prompt in the output where it'll actually start stepping through the files. So this is that initial summarization of what it's going to do, and then it's going to start pulling in branch information um, and crazy output, crazy output, crazy output, lots of crazy output. So this is the actual main file, the Flask file. It's pulling this one in, recognizing that this is the file it needs to work off of because this is where the API endpoints are. So this is where it's pulling this into context. Okay. Two minutes time. And then it's going to turn around and organize how it needs to work on it. So it, it's stepping through a number of things here that it's, it's not fully completing um, to get to the end result, but it will get there. And so we now see that it's it's pulling that file in because it knows that's where we're working. It also looks like it's created a test user list file because that test did not exist. And I did instruct it to also build the tests that come with the code because if you're not testing it, the code doesn't exist. And then it successfully created a PR, number five, and there's the link to the PR. Maybe I did it with that. It's the super wide so nobody knows. It to be fast hours, but like this GPT or other so no, yeah, and that's that's where we saw there was two separate LLMs. Okay, so we had the summarizer LLM. So well, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Yes, I apologize. I'm 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 blending my other project with this one. So I greatly said this is a single agent. Okay, so yeah, the the single agent is stepping through all of this. If so, there's PR. Let me see. Is it over here? Nope. Boom. So let's look at the PR. So it basically, um, since I did tell it to give it a body, um, updated the get method in the user list class to support filtering user based on the query parameters, name, email, age, and color. Modified the Mo MongoDB query to include filter criteria extracted from the request. Add a test case, user test case class to verify the filter functionality and that this closes ticket number one. Because um, that was one thing I asked, is to link back to the issue here. And so if we want to come over here, two commits. Interesting. Files changed. Um, backend app. Um, users, MongoDB users find. So instead of it turning around and finding all users um, out of the database. Um, so this is the, uh, sorry. So this is the main um, Git endpoint. 
to turn around and get the users. So it's going to look in the database and it's going to pull every single user that exists the old way and then return it to the user. Um, the new way is to introduce filtering based on those, those properties and what's passed in and then turn around and filter any of the results out of the database based on those filters. And so that's the code. Okay. Does it work or not? We don't know yet. We, we that's not part, that's not our, it's not my job right now. There we go. That's the right answer. <laughs> but it opens up for a, hey, an no, no. conversation because then like it shows that there's an extreme importance in creating tests and having stable tests within your code so that you can integrate this with the CI pipeline. So any PR that gets submitted by your agent, then that would run through your established test within an established CI pipeline so that when the engineer is assigned to the PR to review it, they can already see, yes, this passed our existing code test and it generated its own test and it passes that too. So the level of confidence isn't necessarily 100 at the time of review, but it's in the high 90s at that point, right? So you are actually correct in suggesting that it's not your job to really care about it, right? Delegate that as much as you can to the pipeline. So the, the new res- it's not in my prompt. That's the new response. It's not in my prompt. I'm about part way through to pay for that. Asking here, was it for me? I was posted in pretty much in the description of the media article about what's that, what the, the ASX Microsoft entitled Evaluating Large Language Model Systems, Metric Shields, and Best Practices. And one of the first things they, uh, one first things they discussed is this integration in the CF pipeline. Mm. Right? So, uh, of this corrupt with the life cycle of that data system, you know, the NLI bonds, uh, the, the birthday value bonds, it, and, and that all. I mean, all. We use that really. really? Nice. I'll stop there. I, I, I would suggest I will decide. Yeah, I need to go back to that one. Cool. Thanks. So, there we go. We got a test. It's built into our pipeline. The PR is out there ready for review. Um, the nice thing is um, this this pipeline doesn't work on this repo. I was, I guess, one of the places I left off with it is GitHub didn't, or ChatGTP didn't do a good job of building out my GitHub actions. Um, you're going to have to have a one-on-one about that. So the, the, the actions don't work, so I can't run tests. But you go back Let's do it. So that was my next step. I need to get the started. Why not? Hey, not it's, I'm, I'm going straight to Maine. I'm going right to Maine. Why not? I, that's how it, that's how you can But and that you repeat. Well, and that's so these, I would like to explore more. And maybe that's more of a prompt is once I get testing fixed is to turn around and have the, the feedback loop come back to the agent or back to the supervisor of what happened in GitHub. So if these tests failed, push that back and let the supervisor delegate down what should happen. Um, and so I, I do in, in my in, in, in my code chain projects, um, when I do have multiple agents, I do have separate test and separate linting agents. And once the developer passes the code and the test to both of them, if either of them has issues with the code, they pass suggestions back to the developer and then start that whole loop back over. And then I, that's- there, there was a chance, just passing you back to be all like, good, well, I mean, oh, good old space and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but you might say, you that five times, still as well. Then, or, yeah, yeah. What, what you're describing is what we were promised with the Devon software developer AI that was announced in March, right? This kind of looping mechanism to produce code based on a problem, push it into prod, and then test the, the results of it. And then based on that result, feed it back into the LLM, fix it, not fix it, right? The, the challenge is that one, I think no one really believed that Devin AI was real. That's, that's a big problem. Uh, but also that these jobs were taking sometimes hours to complete, right? And depending on the size of your code base, obviously that's going to be a thing. You've got to compile it. You know, everything's going to be a little bit different. But I like the idea, right? Because at the end of the day, when we think about just general workforce optimization, just from an individual perspective, the higher level of confidence that we have when we see a PR, and we don't have to spend you know, an hour going through a review of 14,000 files, right? That's going to make us a little bit more efficient. 
and so that we can go back to our precious Netflix video or whatever it is that we're actually doing. We're working at home, right? So I love the idea, right? It's I think I think what we're seeing right here is that the tools are getting us closer to that dream. It's just we've got to continue to develop and iterate on it. To, to, I feel like we're not like like if it were to work, exactly like like so people work well with you, right? So as you know, have your agents, they make whatever they do walk and, and pass. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like Ryan mentioned, right? The, the view agents as like, you're now a manager of a software team, right? You've got some that are junior, some that focus on packaging, some that focus on testing, right? But manage them and build them out in that type of way. And you're absolutely spot on. Your workflow is now more around orchestration, review, validation, then, you know, take the next step, right? But it's, it's funny about that, you know, it's, it, it was not so long, but I actually a pretty good in the, uh, it's not about, about, uh, about assessing the uncle, you know, and, like, right away, it's almost, here's how you do, oh, that's, don't go. Like, don't, don't use that thing too often. It's not on, like, the core AI. Is I teaching that class? <laughs> was that me? <laughs> I feel like that was me. <laughs> if you just say forever to, to write that's what I do work for in the best Now I have to like it, it sort of we shouldn't need this ads, especially if you're gonna have agents break code all the time. Should where you ask perks. Absolutely. So we have the whole like test driven development, right? But what we found, and I don't know if people are still doing that, oh, but shit. we would spend the vast majority of our time building out our tests before we would actually build the code itself. And what ultimately, yes, you would have higher success rates with the development of your code, but you'd be spending 90% of your time either fixing or kind of hacking the existing test just to get it through. And not to throw CrowdStrike under the bus here, right? But that's exactly what happened, right? They had a regular expression parser based engine, and they were just making small adjustments to the regex parser uh, for their, their CI pipelines. And we know what happened. If you had a Windows machine with CrowdStrike last week or a couple of weeks ago, we know exactly what the result is, right? So to your point, we don't want to build tests just because we say, hey, we've got the test. We need the test there to say your software is working as designed. But building those tests now has, if we build it with integration to agents, the impetus is is a higher priority than it's ever been right? because we get need high confidence to validate like what we're doing is is actually legit. I mean, it, it's cost, the cost of developing it's cheap too to aid to design and test, right? True. From like so. organization perspective, like operations, how many developers you have on your team? Yeah, how much makes me that that's part of the problem with testing is it's expensive. Well, I'm small guy in a small shop, so I can only do the minimum testing to sort of make sure my thing doesn't break. Test every single edge case, right? Right. I see that I have a fleet of agents doing all the test design. Now it's second on. Exactly. And your ability to get something, a new feature into the market is accelerated, right? So that makes the that makes it a little bit more exciting to actually work on a project. So you're like, I got new features, I got new ideas, let's get them in the market faster. I can delegate all that logic to these agents with valid tests, then we're gonna accelerate. Yeah, I like the thought. Well, one option here as well, right, is you have this function now, it's in what I, some random user, uh, still in requires, right? I'd be true with that. So, so some part of it says, push that back on me, right? Okay, Leon, you asked for this new feature request. Here's a plant, here's a beta. You take it. Mm. Right? You want this feature? Here's a grind. Go grab that feature. Download it, use it. And you tell me if it's Sure. Tell me if the window from shoe got it. And then I can I can say, yeah, that, that grass one oh every would fix that. Mm-hmm. And then there is a piece better as well, which almost allows you if I could ask them, you wanted to be time voted that yeah, I asked for it. I'm worried that you would never have touched it or narrow to see. Now we have this whole new for feature dev team. So tell them hey, feature could use that part, make them stay in the review, which is saying you pay off basic and shit as well. And then I can do some, yeah. So it's a work if that system can be very good in essentially tell you get that work. So it's you know almost like another layer of stuff. Great, right? but your customer widely. That's cool for sure. It's a voluntary canary testing. Yeah, I mean I want a feature. 
So actually, I would eat some of that mix. Right. right. We need to try it. In the open source world, 1000%, right? Because we see PRs on really popular projects. You know, look at Ansible, for instance, right? An automation framework. There are so many PRs that they just have dedicated armies of, of engineers reviewing, validating the idea, right? But if we could empower them to say, you've got the idea, state it in clear text or in Markdown or whatever format, right? And then now you have the ability of running some agents to develop, test it, and then report back on your so, thing. I want to make sure that we get caught in time. Can I also make sure that client get rid of its code? Yeah. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that we do have the after now hours mix so we add it to your decision. So not to take away <clears throat> so much. I'm, back to the sure. I'm done. I'm just trying to fit, fix the GitHub issues. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, that's that's what I got. I, I hope everybody enjoyed or learned something or yeah, it's you know, um, fix the, the the code that I have here. Um, I have up on a GitHub gist and I'll I'll share all those in the community along with the uh, the links to the documents. Oh, yeah. One last thing. The issue is there, but we don't. Um, so Langsmith. So it picked up four runs. It looks like the last run to fix the GitHub Actions is still going. Um, but the run before, you can actually see all the steps the agent had to get through. So create a new branch, overview of files and current branch, search code, read file, update file, read file, update file, invalid tool. So these, the, the going back to that initial value, you know, these are all tools that would have to be built by your team um, if you weren't using something like this. So yep. write it. Uh, I, I want to thank you so much for sharing where you're at with this, for sharing your knowledge, for taking the time to go through, um, to get the, the documentation and, and you know, to learn in the open. Yep. Um, you know, not only have I learned from or so much even this today, not only from you, but from the conversations in the room. Uh, definitely I don't want to squash any conversations. And I want to encourage us to use conversations about the subjects, about these subjects, you know, in our mixed afterwards, but also, you know, in, in our in our discords and whatnot. Um, on that note, if Ryan, if you can release your uh, screen, there you go. And hand off the mic, I believe, to your Kareem. And then the uh, Kareem, if you can share your desktop. Very good. Thanks, Dick. Good, good show. Under, but I've seed, seen a uh, calling for two calling calling for a llama uh, release. Right? And Kareem was actually making that on, her, on his own. Um, and I'm going to continue to fill time as, as everything's being clicked over. I can you hand over to my board as well there, Ryan? Yeah. No. So I'm not going to steal any of Cream's thunder, but the, the work that uh, was going upstream as a link chain project got released. I believe your first Python package. I mean, yeah, I yeah, with yeah, the latest. Yeah. So briefly speak that there. You're in, you're in Inception world right now. God damn. But I still see Inception online. There you go. So let me go in the dark. And in, you are on mute. Come up here for me. Switch myself. Where um, from the session to the yeah, we're going to try. So, you know, this is... I have been doing proprietary stuff because it costs money. I had... Since I could do office experimentation, try to always experiment with a lot of money. It may cost a lot of money. It's very promising. So, so it all is well with the Lama. Uh, and then, of course, I'm like, it was moving in one function. A lot more. Or, that was... Just uh, one uh, thing that was done Line. All these, you know, right, right. The Lama themselves, because you know, you can't just be a slash generator slash chat endpoint and leave at LLM point. You get bored up with LLM after a point. It's like there's only so much you can interact with them. You need to be interacting outside work. Uh, you know, this work you saw with Ryan's uh, 
you know, yes, you could talk about, okay, here's a copy of my code. What can I do to fix it? What give it access to some tools and have it fix it for you? So that's so where that's I think, where I think uh, the power yeah. of the agentic frameworks lie is not just the ability to let you interact with just the compressed knowledge that exists inside the weights and biases of a um, language model, but also its ability to interact um, the external world and bring in that knowledge and you know, uh, be able to interact with other um, external groups. So Olam with me recently, so I, I did some work on the Olama functions for, uh, uh, submitted or use use that for that idea. I ran in, so I participated in a recent uh, NVIDIA ethical contest. And uh, one of the things, one of the requirements was to choose one of NVIDIA, they wanted to use NVIDIA's service or use something else with, or from NVIDIA. I think that's what I'm So I think just use NVIDIA's endpoints because an integration already existed in um, Langchain. Problem with that, that inference endpoint doesn't support full time. You could Try to find tools to it, and then you quickly can make such a item do with this because they are hardly that they will have a function essential. So I said, okay, yes, I did this work with the um, Olama functions, which was basically just add a wrapper around shadow that did the, the work to cover for my tools and we structured all in with structures. Extracted to Olama into a Python function that I could just then wrap around other. Giant models. Uh, uh, giant model, uh, you're using that as a very good change with the interface with other documents and providers. So, in the giant model, and Saturn Media, the giant models for the media is the IP and then what. And so, a lot of the tools like this, which that allow for the did that. I couldn't find it. A lot of the things I'm talking about is. And before you ran over the control the up from the other end. So you're going to be processing and then get over the other end both processing uh, before you get any uh, handy uh, uh, with other set of PRs. And so, you know, that's that can be provided. And this is probably the longest we can be hard to not get emerging because they did their own uh, the advancements. They came out to well, uh, and then they did our present by this for our uh, Yes, in about twenty. I was okay with uh, that. Already, uh, something until I realized something not going well. That is inside. Like it gave me big score, and um, so I tried to do few days on the tool list. You know, I thought we want to do this. We could like I like I mean, we sit on our um, GitHub uh, and uh, our like that. So that's the history of that. This. Presentation came up with a very creative name, LLM and tool. So, what is tool? You know, tool. So, again, the name started out as function calling. Right? Which, you know, it's very clear. Like, everybody knows what function calling is, except that it doesn't do what sets it ought to do. In, in, intuition says that they don't play to that in much. Uh, but, so, which is why I like the word, the phrasing tool use a lot better than function calling. I think uh, Langchain team might have come up with that, uh, but that's why I may be a little bit wrong. But, Essentially, you're using a language, a uh, live language model to generate output in a format that could be taken in, processed by an external body, and then make full calls on behalf of you. So, essentially, what uh, ends up happening is you're giving your tool definitions, you know, what your you know, tool name is, what, what is the grammar definition, and you're telling your LNM to say, you know, say, you know, if you feel that you don't have the answer or Always use a tool, and this is the X output that I'm expecting uh, to be in this format. Uh, and because it's a predefined format, it's easy to then work on the you know, hand it over to that output to something else that can look at it, that can do what it needs to do, and give you back the uh, output and work. So, really, what we've been calling function calling, tool calling, tool use is just the LLM that we could generate JSON. LLM, yeah. that's all it is. Because once you're able to generate output in a Create it in a, in a fashion where you you have a structure with your sign, you can then you can work with it. You can, because LNMs, the output is unstructured. Let's yes. explain that. Or it could be anything. Say JSON is structured output, but you know, any structured output is also unstructured. You know, so you know, essentially, dual uses, if you're if you're making uh, if you're running a prompt against another LM and you're asking it for 
JSON output and you're telling it, okay, I want these things in my data. Your hassle is there. What would you know? If you if you act, if we had looked at the bank set tracing uh, uh, that uh, um, Brian score generated, somewhere in there you have seen two definitions for uh, GitHub. For each one of those separate posts, there's a predefined not defined, but there's a agreed upon schema that captures what parameters need to be fed into this. Uh, GitHub right. itself is not making any. So it's not making any calls. All, all it's doing is saying, okay, here are the instructions that you can take to whatever tool executor that you might have access to. As long as a tool exists that, that meets that definition, you can be pretty certain that it'll be it'll run. Um, you, but what can you use to need in Square? Well, you can call all some other Python libraries. So you can make external API calls. You can call your own custom code. Yeah. Nightchain makes it very easy to just add a tool decorator on top of a Python function. You can use it as a tool in your API. But you can also use, you know, what we're calling tool means just to generate structured out, you know. Um, and where that becomes really useful is when you want to extract some information out of unstructured data. So, you know, if you have been following any discussions around graph right, for instance, or uh, knowledge graphs, your it that works because we're able to extract information out of the unstructured um, body of text. So we need a certain uh, JSON scheme where we say, okay, I need I need you to look for entities in there, and an entity in this format. I need you to look at for relationships in this body of uh, uh, text, and the relationships are in the format entity as relationship to other. So I think of those as, as definitions. Uh, and because you're getting data out in a structure uh, that's predefined, you know, that also falls technically under two things. When you think it should be the other way around, you know, you need to have, it should sure. have been called uh, structured output and the tool D should have been a uh, feature. Just the way it's named, structured output is a feature, of it, which is backwards, but again, that's just, you know, we have open air design uh, for that. Again, how does it work? You start I mean, with your from, you have an element. The element I mean, needs to have, you know, it needs to meet a certain criteria. Right? The element needs to be good with JSON. It needs to be able to take your JSON schema definition and be able to generate JSON objects that meet that. Otherwise, tool is not going to work. Um, and the, um, um, the chat in video, the chat model that I mentioned, when I use that and the, the uh, Z wrapper that I uh, developed, I tried using that with Lama 3, worked beautifully. Pi 3, worked nicely. Pi 3, wish it. All of a sudden, it didn't want to comply. We could not create JSON output yeah. So, uh, just using the wrapper is not going to be efficient. We need to have your LLM that meets the criteria. It needs to be able to follow a JSON schema and then be able to generate conforming JSON uh, to that. So what ends up happening is you give you you give you a problem and with your problem, we give four definitions. So, the, there's a new function that's been exposed with the version two uh, for to support tool calling called five tools. So, your if you if you chat more. In, as um, uh, the support Zoom calling, that means it has it has a limitation for points. Uh, you take your problem, you give it your pool definitions, which is basically just a JSON structure uh, representation of the pool definition. You uh, feed it into your LLM. What you get out is a pool call, which is just again a JSON object with the name of the tool and the parameters in a predefined uh, performance structure. You give that to the executor. Executor looks at that in order. It also has then get access to those tools for which you've generated the tool definitions. It will find the right tool that matches that uh, tool call definition, and then it'll execute that the parameter that this, and then we get the tool up. Again, so again. what makes tool use possible? I covered this a little bit. Uh, your model needs to be able to generate uh, JSON matches. Yeah. And your inference engine needs to be able to give yeah. support. And yeah. your entry processing stuff, you know, where you're able to give it the tool definitions, say, we're to accept whatever meaningful information you can out of it so that. When it's generating the output, it's able to be able to give you back structured JSON. And the second step is what the two volume wrapper that I uh, developed uh, takes care of. If your, if your inference engine doesn't support it already, uh, you can use that um, uh, two volume uh, wrapper with it, and hopefully it'll be sufficient. To okay. And you see uh, a little bit of the history from Olama functions to two volume and them. Olama functions is where I really started, you know. My contribution to all our function back in was pre existing. Somebody had already worked on that to make there to make already, you know, you know sub like generation one function body type code work against Olama. I uh, modified that 
to get it to work with the, the current implementation of Spark English. Extracted the code out into a Python mixin. Uh, this is basically just a wrapper class. Uh, it lets you extend your existing class with additional functions. So a lot of you know a lot of functions will suck it out into that uh, so that it can work with any Jack model, not just a lot. Uh, and then uh, do its own package and publish from Python. So the source code is on GitHub. The package is available on two calling your lem. Now the notebooks here. Now I'll take you to the notebook. Uh, but no, you know, the question: Why? Why would you want to install Polygon but first? But why? Why would I? Why would I use this package? Well, reason one is you want to use Google Polygon, and your inference engine doesn't support. Well, why? Why would your inference engine not support? Well, you know, if you're using OpenAI, that supports it already. Uh, and Tropic supports it already. Rock, they have support for Google Polygon. Uh, yeah, in fact, they even released a fine tune of Slama three. To make to make it better at Google uh, use. So why would you use something like this? Well, and now even allow us to use this. You know, we have a lot of support still use. Well, there's still plenty of other ones that might not use. And maybe you're maybe you're developing your own niche infant service. So maybe you're working straight with Llama CPP. CPP won't support it because that's not its niche case. It's use case is still loading the uh, weights into the GPU and text separation. Or, you know, or if you're working with a niche Inference service or inference, inference provider or a more general purpose inference provider. So a general purpose would be that NVIDIA where they're doing both, you know, they're doing a lot of things and they're currently not there yet. You know, eventually they might, um, issue an update that will support Google Party, but currently they don't. Or if you're you know, working with, you know, a lot of innovations coming out of smaller teams and maybe, you know, they are behind on tooling. So you could use this as a software. And that'll get you the ability to use uh, tooling type features with um, inference services that don't get support. How to take your inference engine and make it a full body uh, LLM? As simple as you, you have your full body LLM package imported. You, you I've added here, I'm using Chat Lama, even though Chat Lama supports it. Uh, there was still this one feature when I was first testing it that they didn't support now. They can support it now because Nike keeps an update. It made it not important for individual chat models to uh, implement uh, output. But in this case, I'm using table number. But with the wrapper, so it's going to use the tool calling, tooling stick abilities from the packet and not the, uh, the one that it comes with. All you have to do is create a new class, drop in this mix in as the first class that you're inheriting from. Second one is the uh, one that you want, you want to extend. And that's it. You can then initialize your calling LLM as it tools and then. From that point on, you have access to uh, bind tools and, and you can uh, dig it under. So if I give it access to the Pepepo search tool, then if I do, I don't, you know, tools, which means this is the Ulama uh, Bison, uh, by yeah. access to quotes. And if I say, okay, who want this in what might have been shielding in Paris from FX 2024, what I didn't expect as the output is not the answer to this question. That's not what Moodle does. What, that, what it does is it gives you Something similar to this, it gives you an AI message with the property of tool calls populated with the definition of the tool that you want to call on with the parameters. In this case, it's what it's saying is, okay, you need to call the ethical search here. And here, there are uh, parameters you can parse it. Uh, the arguments take the old, just has one argument called query. And it basically reformatted my prompt into a search query. And it gives, it gives me this. Now I can take this and I can use it in a, in a tool executor. And the tool executor, as long as it has access to a that matches this name, will know how to, if I give it to a tool executor that doesn't have it, it'll give me an error. So it will say I got box. So, so, go, go. so, 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 this presentation is available on our, uh, repo. So if you, if you're in, um, Austin Lanking, go the resources. Presentations, uh, NLM is this presentation that I've been sharing. This notebook is the one that sort of walks you through some of the features. You can run this if you have an instance of Obama running locally in your infrastructure. You know, you can run this uh, to test it out. Or you can uh, keep this button open in Colab and test it out in um, Google Colab as well. This one, because we're using Olama in this, there is no API keys are needed. You can basically just take this so long as you're running a uh, T4 GPU, you can just go to this one. Some cells might be commented out 
those have to do with installing Opalama. You can just uncomment them first. PCI utils, all it does is it gives it install certain utilities so that Colab can detect your cheating. Otherwise, when you install Obama, it will say, well, you install Obama, but I can't see the GPU, so it might run CPU mode. So that even though it runs decently fast, but this will make it run a little bit faster. Uh, next cell essentially starts the instance of uh, Obama that you installed in the previous set. Um, after that, uh, Obama pull name of the model is how you download a model. Um, what models you can download, just go to olama.com, go to the model stage, and you can see a whole set of models. You can search for uh, you know, four generation models. You can search for uh, Lama family of models. Um, and you know, so in this case, I use 3.1 uh, for this uh, notebook. This cell will take a while to run. I put it, you know, I put the, the magic uh, uh, double percentage capture so that we don't have to see the 10,000 lines of output generates. Because what it's doing is it's downloading uh, a four bit quantized uh, version of uh, 3.1, four bit quantized. Four to five gigabytes in size. And depending on when you're running this in Colab, yeah. it won't be done in a matter of seconds or it can take a few minutes, but it generates a lot of output. Next, we are installing a few packages. Um, we have our Dusty Langchain package, our Langchain Core community, Langchain Olama, we have the Langdorf package, that will go search so that I can run that flow locally. HTTPX, might, you might not need to install this locally, but Colab. Doesn't work, doesn't like it if you don't have this package. Uh, Landchain, well, one of the Landchain uh, packages has a dependency on it that it doesn't, uh, it's, this might have been fixed already. I don't know, but safe to install. And then the last one is a free polygon. We do a few imports. Um, this is the same token in the start in this slide. Uh, I'm basically creating a new called uh, a good use version of Chattel Lama. Again, Chattel Lama supports two things, you're going to do it this way. But this is just to demonstrate that. Initializing a uh, the uh, LLM within, testing whether the LLM is working. I just asked about the capital of England. It answers because that's, you know, it's, it's a, all the external data. Attach uh, the capital tool, uh, bind, uh, bind tool. And then I asked like, the same question that was in the slide. And then the, you know, what you see here is basically what was on the slide as well. Um, you asked it a question, what was on the what was on the spur that needed to use a tool. And it Ended up calling the tool, or the, the, uh, ended up calling the uh, generating the code or use definition with that. Now, one of the biggest, even if you are not tending to use tool use, tool use is really tending to use because it gives you the this feature, or, you know, uh, called, it gives you access to this method called with structured output. And that simplifies a lot of NLP type tasks. You know, what is an NLP type? Like that, you know, you're trying to looking at the content you want data out, but you want it in a specific format. With the uh, structured output, you can define the format that you want. In this case, I defined a simple uh, identity class. You don't have to create a identity class. You can actually create a JSON definition, and it'll work. Uh, in this one, it's just simpler to demonstrate with the identity class. Um, I've created something called a contact info. It has the following fields: has name, organization, position, and name. Email as string fields. I've given them the definitions, and I also said, okay, a list of uh, strings uh, for skills. I have my, uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. I a version of the LLM with the structured output. So I basically, if I uh, do the LLM, which I've initialized with the uh, two use capabilities, this will also work with uh, any LLM uh, chat model that supports me, by the way. And you, uh, I say bit structured output, and here is the speed up of the output that, that I need in the form of either a pedantic class or a JSON schema. And then you take that object. Now you can send it, yes. sense like you, in this case, I've said, okay, there is a content contributor for Austin Langton Meetup Group. You can put it in Python, go on his code is questionable, enjoys building your applications, uh, his email address is so and so. And then I say, okay, I want you to, you know, so because this one is set with uh, structured output, any input I give it, the output is going to be in the Fortnite platform. I mean, uh, meet that comment. So it actually, in this case, gave me a pre filled object uh, of that uh, contact info type. It identified the name correctly. It identified the name of the organization correctly, or uh, Austin Lanchin Meetup Group. It identified the position correctly. It was able to extract my email address out of it. 
and it populated the skills. Yeah. Now, you can imagine, you know, whether you, you might have lots and lots of reporting data in unstructured format, and you want to store that in a database, in a tablet format. Well, with structured output, gives you a short getting there. Now you can just batch process a bunch of paragraphs and expect, you know, structured, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the data, data to be in a specific format. Now, this one could fit, you know, LLM, depending on the LLM that you're using. And like, that's why it's important to have um, a user model, an LLM that has good case on it, an LLM that. If this fails, you can actually initialize it so that instead of giving you just the uh, strongly typed object, it and then you both the strongly typed object and a the sort of uh, JSON version or dictionary. Uh, that means that you just have to give it, you know, uh, sort raw, of raw output equals true. And then we give you a dictionary with one of them being strongly typed and the other one being a dictionary. So even if the uh, so identity parsing fails at some step, because, you know, I have a a required field and it can't find that, uh, identity will say, well, this is not good. And it won't give you enough. But you could still get, you could still have some salvage uh, from it. Next part of the notebook goes over how we might use something like uh, this, in, you know, or with tools inside a land graph agent. Um, I've just created a simple land graph agent from uh, the, the code is nothing special. It's basically some their introduction to land graphs uh, where you can start with, uh, you know, you have a node that does the LNM uh, calls, basically it passes the prompt to it. And out of that, it will either do a tool call or it will just say, you know what, I have the answer to this, I'll just answer it. Uh, it will make as many tool calls as needed. Uh, so this is sort of their, um, if you're a simple implementation of a React. But, uh, I mean, I'm just passing a similar tool here for, uh, uh, you know, um, for type go. In this case, you know, thing to note is, so I have my tools here. I'm okay. creating a element uh, that has the tools bound to it. I'm also creating something for a tool node, which is basically a node and a, a land graph node, a pre built node with a tool executor in it already. So you don't have to do stuff. Uh, if you look at some very early examples of land graph, they actually had a function where it would look at, okay, what's the tool call? And then it would say, okay, do I have this? And it would execute that manual for an executor. Tool nodes sort of simplifies that all your, you know, just pass it your tools and you can now use it as a node in your land graph. So my land graph looks very simple. You know, I have the Oracle node, which is basically just my LLM with tools. I had a tool node, which is my tool node from above. Um, I start my, you know, I say, okay, my starting edge is or Oracle node. My uh, conditional uh, edge, you know, output some Oracle can either go to tool or can end. And then tool output some tool node will always go to Oracle node. And that's where the, the reactive gate comes in. This is what the uh, graph looks like. This is, then, what, this is what the, I ask it a question. And this, I mean, is, what this the, is because I'm using a very simple agent. I'm not, I don't have anything that evaluates the output that comes out of a tool to determine whether I should. So you know, right now, it's just passing it to the tool and it's up to the uh, LLM to figure out whether the answer is there or not. Um, what it benefits on is a separate tool output evaluation that would look and say, you know, do I have the answer to this? If I do, then okay, now it's okay to end rather than sending it up because here there is no instructions for this. There is no prompt template provided to this one. So it'll just keep looping if it doesn't know it needs to stop. Um, sort of like the early versions of the agents, you know, that, in, that ended up with uh, eating $100 of uh, Ricky's uh, mic there. So, and yeah, good. Keep spinning. It's a llama. You know, I'm running on a free instance of Colab. You know, I, I don't have to worry, in it. I have to worry about that. But uh, a slightly more sophisticated version of the agent um, would not run in this way. But essentially, what you're seeing is like, first, it's going for the Oracle node. It's going it means that it needs to go in the tools node. So it creates a query out of it. It runs, but gets the tool call, goes to a tool node, which executes it. It returns the message. In this case, it didn't have the answer. So it just kept going until it found compelling enough answer in the search. If you were wondering who won the silver button, it is this guy. That's the best, you know, character game. So in that example, you show what portion was, was it the doctor? Though last thing you had the important was like the end. Well, within that uh, pipeline you mentioned, just that the actual, the executor was the tool though. Tool node has uh, what's called a, there's a tool executor uh, pre-built inside 
uh, language and you can give it a a, two, a, a node with a toolbox and it will execute that. I see. Yeah, the tool node automates that. So it, it takes up, it takes out, uh, you know, step of identifying which tool to call. Tool node will look at, it'll, it'll take your tool call output, which will have the tool, uh, the tool use definition name of the tool and the parameters. And we'll also have access to the tools themselves. And it's okay, I'll say, okay, this definition matches this. Let me just run this and give you that. Yeah. So let me give an example of use case. I like to eat a lot. I like to eat a lot. I get a lot of my recipes off of TikTok. And what I'll do is I'll get a transcription of the video, right? That's unstructured. Yep. Some people might even omit the ingredients within their, their verbal dialogue entirely. But if I could feed that transcript and so it's rule like this and say, here's the, here's the schema, here's the pipe answer model that's the one just generating, this would be a good insertion. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's, that's a very good use case of, uh, Specifically, the good structure output, uh, you know, like I have a broad database where I store all my recipes that I just parse from the internet. That some of them might be from blogs that everyone knows, like WordPress blogs are all structured differently and, you know, all this mess. So having a tool like this that could take structure or assembly structure or unstructured data and output it to you, a bigger XD find against an model would help me accelerate my catalog of recipes. Absolutely. That that is the use case. That that is exactly the use case or something like that. And the executor would actually make the rest. As well, if you have uh, yes, yeah, I guess. A question in back. That's what. It's like the multi multi query the treadmill. Mm-hmm. So and one of the ideas I had is, uh, if you want to ask, you know, the concept there is that it regenerates your prompts in however many five different ways, and if you wanted to. To find the current perspectives and say, ask it from this perspective and this perspective. I mean, with that, that's kind of something I'm thinking about. Would that be a good mistake? Could be doing the acting to Yes. Yeah. yeah. Then you know, I can make a use case out of my chain and then graph out of anything. So, so it sells your fault. So I got a little lost. So then you get out of the course, you should take my other transfer. Mm-hmm. So the problem is if we went steps or ingredients left out and kind of arcs that way, how do we fill in that? Yeah, so it, it, some of them, some of the, the transcripts are great uh, because they will have steps. A lot of them they use the tablespoons. Sometimes it'll be in metric, you know, so like that, that whole conversion process. To start the recording here. I'm also recording on screencast, so hopefully I'll have another thing. Can you share your desktop? Please, Rob, when you can see the sessions interface, there's that button right there. No, not that one. That one. Yep. Oh, yeah. And then share whatever screen that you're going to use. Are you using Windows? Free, free screen. I was bringing and that's I know your entire screen right there. Yeah. I there we go. We see your screen. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be okay, cool. relatively brief. Uh, so as far as me, you know, your years, my goal is that I'm a repair, I want to build my replacement. So I think, um, you know, for a long time, I've been trying to automate various components of the financial analysis stuff that we do. Um, I'll have to use the databases, adding structure to unstructured data by building a lot of different, uh, types of algorithms and stuff to do that. But now with the advent of all rounds, now I've got a list of a couple of interfaces to get a whole lot of language based data and other multiple that be out there and finish the job, I think. And so um, I'm trying to do that as fast as possible because I think it's it's gonna happen whether I'm like doing it or not. So I'm gonna do the job to do it. Or certainly be in that mix. And I've got a fair number of, of um, my legacy customers that are interested in this and it's very actively evolving space. And uh, I'll just throw out there, I'd love to collaborate with anyone else in that arena that wants to, um, to certainly let me know. Um, one component of this is I'm always trying to test the waters and see what new tools are out there that can make make things uh, better. I'm not going to show you the main thing, this alpha pilot project. Uh, to get into that, you'll need to sign an MBA and, and talk to me separately. But what I'm going to show you is a side project that, you know, bring my uh, words on. Uh, I looked at Lane Graph and said, all right, is this thing something I could use to 
orchestrate some of the exempic type workflows that I'm, that I'm kind of work on here. Historically, I've been a guy that holds to like the big cloud providers like AWS to a certain extent at Azure. I uh, use their uh, distributed orchestra- orchestration capabilities uh, to break things down into small serverless units and kind of work through the cloud as it were. But I was intrigued by um, Lane Graph as a possibility to do some orchestration on a smaller scale, not necessarily things that really dig into big data world, but but things that pass back and forth calls to to agents and uh, and develop something useful out of it. And so last uh, we started this what a week or two ago, maybe, but the last couple of days I decided to spend a little bit more time on this. So um, forgive us for being incredibly buggy. Um, it's got like zero uh, the zero error handling in it. Um, just something back together to see that the kind of show what can be done. But some buggy it's alpha. It's <laughs> pre alpha. Forgive us. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, oh, sit right here. So, um, basic idea here is um, what can I do in the finance world that uh, one small piece of something you want to automate? Uh, well, um, there's something called Porter Spy Forces. And there's a, there's a Harvard professor in 1979 published a book. He said, All right, how would you want to, how do you want to analyze uh, any company? He broke it down and said, basically five forces at play here that determine the value of the company. You've got um, degree of competition or robbery in space. Thank God, you know, this might be high competition would be cell phones. I don't think they differ. Everybody's got an iPhone, it seems, but uh, Android, iPhone kind of thing. Uh, what's the threat of new entrants? Here, I would say it'd be sort of like what we're talking about here. All of us is a threat. Each of us here is, I think, a threat to a legacy business. If we can invent something new, now with Hello Lens, I'm trying to be a threat to uh, legacy financial analysts in a sense, doing this all by hand. Uh, bargaining power of suppliers. Um, in this case, um, I would say Walmart would be an example in the, in the sense that they have a lot, of, a lot of bargaining power relative to their suppliers, right? So if you lose your contract with Walmart, you're out of business. So you got bargaining power of buyers. Uh, classic example here might be rental car companies that have a lot of negotiating leverage. They're buying cars uh, from, uh, say, auto manufacturers. Uh, and the threat of substitute products, you know, the classic example would be Coke, and Pepsi, but not just sort of the direct complements or, or uh, counterparts, but like, you know, do I just want to have juice for water, Gatorade, like that, right? So you put all those together, and the thought was, according to Porter, is you can successfully kind of figure out the degree of, of uh, strength with each of these forces at play, you can basically determine how, how much money this company's spending. So I thought, well, all right, let's play with this a little bit. Let's, uh, why don't we take any company in the S&P 500, uh, search the web for features that might play into each of these five categories, uh, ask an LLM agent to summarize the, the, each of the, all of the information found in those categories. And then develop a score for each one of them, one for 10. And then yeah, develop well, what's the degree of uh, rivalry, entrance, suppliers, buyers, substitutes. And then based on that, calculate what would be the premium. So if you're familiar with some basic valuation, what would be the, say, price to earnings ratio for this particular member of the S&P 500 relative to the average for the whole S&P? Based on that, then calculate that compared to the current premium. Based and, on that, get your stock price appreciation or appreciation over the next 12 months, let's say. So um, when we break this down into you know, what, what's cool about Lang Graph, well, for one, it can generate these little graphics and plots. Yeah, that's, what you, that's, one of the, that's one of the better features. It's <laughs> not complicated I think it is. I mean, when I thought Lang Graph, I thought, okay, we're, it's got a lot of built-in language LLM capability. That's the Lang part, right? And Graph has probably got some kind of graph database structure. Honestly, for me, I think it's neither um, because it's there's really no language capability that I found built into it. It's simply an orchestration structure. I would almost call it like um, a state flow is what I would term it. Because basically, you're taking a, a state, a dictionary of items, so it's got an input type output, and you're passing it around here. You got uh, you can say it's a, um, a graph in the sense that it has these nodes and it has edges between the nodes. And you can have Conditional edges, you can have multiple destinations and things like that. You can have feedbacks. 
So it's just a basic way to take your, your program and do, you know, fan outs, fan ends, all that stuff, right? Simple little orchestration and engine. Um, and um, that's where I think it's, it's value based. It just enables you to visualize how your, how your code put together. Little, some of the nuances I, I felt I had to get comfortable with were things like where you're merging uh, state back together. So in my case, I fanned out to, um, all five forces at once. So the idea is you can run into parallel. Another benefit of, of the uh, the HS mobile threading is kind of throws it out there, does this all at once. So I'm making all the LLS calls in parallel. I'm searching the web. I can do that in parallel without much effort. Pretty you know, couple lines of code, stand it out and pay it back. Uh, now, when I stand it back in, you got to be careful because it's dealing basically with one parent node that you've got to like organize this all back into. It was a little more cumbersome than I'm used to just, you know, Throw it in Python. The top note for me would just be a dictionary, and I could have, um, you know, dictionaries and then dictionaries. I got lists of then dictionaries. I can have, in my case, a lot of pandas data frames and dictionaries. That for me is the rate. You can't go throw a pandas data frame easily into the parent node, which wants to serialize the data, and so you're going to have to like figure out a way to convert it and serialize it in some kind of JSON type object, and then feed it into this maps and things. So I found that. If you're dealing with big data objects and like pandas data frames, probably not the best use case for this. But in most of those cases, honestly, I don't have this big fragmented workflow. I have generally a data pipeline where it's in step one, step two, step three. I don't need this whatsoever, right? So that was just a minor lesson learned from data. Um, but other than that, you can build your own custom functions when you're merging things in. It's basically when you get A and B, put them together, are you going to combine them? Is it A plus B? An average of the two are the conditions in which you want to pick A. If it's got meet certain criteria, what conditions you get to pick B. Pretty straightforward and as flexible as your mind allows, honestly, for how you want to put that together. Um, so uh, uh, that's it for the basic flow. Um, uh, see if I can do a quick demo of it. Uh, if it doesn't work, you get your money back. Try some new track, some stocks, never see it. Oh, you might notice a small red yeah, uh, thing here. Uh, this is, I would, it's, uh, well, first of all, here, I'll, let me do a couple, you know, to get it more from here, and then I'll, I'll just highlight why. Or is it useful? No, I mean, this is basically what I want. I, want the, I mean, I did this 25 years ago. Um, I like, it's kind of what you give your, your uh, freshman business school students and say, all right, hey, analyze a company or compare two companies using words by courses. But there's some limits. I don't, not that I don't think it's possible. It's just, you know, this is a day and a half hacking it together. One of the limits is the information fed in is pretty high level. I use this uh, tably search tool, uh, which doesn't do a real deep search. It feeds you like the top blur of, you know, the different websites it goes to. Um, if I was building, building this proper, I would at a minimum want to build an extra layer to that where you're getting the search results, rank them, navigate to each of the search results and parse through uh, the real meter of all of it, the source information. And then have a whole lot more layers of analysis I'd be joining on agents, agents and stuff. This is just real quick and dirty. Um, and you get, you get something working. Um, so if you have something like each of a web search, they have like a rack system, all the all company profiles. In a database somewhere, then it would be sign the NDA, change of value, saying let's put something in that. Yeah, all of your price source. Um, wait, you know, you're, you're talking about combining uh, like a data source, and actually, Lightjay has SCC file links, and um, like I've actually done a lot of the same stuff. So combining the uh, API data with light search data. So. So, uh, oh, you can go for any of those things or, um, like Ben QPC. Yeah, I need Ben G. I mean, I've uh, played around with some off the shelf stuff. I mean, but it's, um, I mean, the kind of things I'm doing behind the, behind the curtain as we're in this arena is, is, um, I mean, I've got like hedge funds, you know, financial analysts that have a lot of, um, and their, their ways of doing things. It's really building the mosaic, right? So SEC documents, honestly, as a self side analyst, that is sort of like the last thing I'd, I'd go through. Yeah. Right. Um, cause you get most of your information to other sources. Like, um, 
you know, their investor relations something which, for example, has a lot more valuable operational statistics than you'll get in essence. So if you go to the SEC anchor, you know, it's nice and parsed and get the XBRL stuff and all that, great. But it's not the meat of what you're really Yeah, and that's that was my approach because a lot of the data sources are incomplete. So I'm like, you need to yeah. try to combine them together. And- that, that's definitely, uh, I would say, a core piece of, of this is getting the right, and even predating all the LLM stuff, what I spent about a close to the last 20 years doing, doing is adding, getting structured, good, high quality data. It's useful. Um, so yeah, IBM, I heard somebody throw that one out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's see what we got. Can you need any the it's I I hear some of your standouts uh, these aren't population companies or each time it's sort of right driving what it thinks about you it's from the Austin range. So let's see, I've asked it in the code to I've asked the LLM to normalize relative to um to the to the average of the S P five hundred. That's the extent of the normalization. There's no statistical rigor on that. I'm trusting the the brain that's has been trained. So again, don't invest on this. The other thing it suffers from is you'll see almost every case, it's going to give you some upside potential, which I think certain of them must take. Yeah. Which at any next time manager will probably tell you is a problem with all their uh, all their sell side analysts if they're they're chronically optimistic. So everybody's always looking for a good short, right? Um, so maybe it's been trained on too much optimism out there. I think I mean that you thought that by full place five minute popular this course. But then, like Abe's already those guys, I'm curious to see if that's new. Yeah, I see slightly tree the model. I gross development. Yeah, I mean, here's one. I mean, well, let's put it in Jimmy. Let's look at this one first. I'll show you another example. I don't think, I think this is just chronic optimism. It's not necessarily like um, suffering from. So, so your stock that should be batched. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is interesting. I mean, this is actually lower than I've seen for some of the others. It substitutes quite low. I'm curious what it says. Significant pressure from substitutes. I think that's fair, right? Yeah. And then it gives a detail. So basically, this detail is what it packaged out of the web searches. And then it gave a summary. I asked it to do, I ran a fighting model based, you know, added structure. This is it give me a summary of what all you found and then it gave me the score. So, so there you have that. You've got each of the tabs from the different um, categories. So, um, so, yeah, let's try. So, let's do it. And, uh, um, the other one I looked at was Exxon was interesting to me. Um, I've covered the energy space for a long, long time. And uh, oil and gas has not been a uh, favorite in the general you know, political, social context, whatever. Um, these dirty hydrocarbon producers, right? Um, and by the way, I just printing like again, just, just going through the process. This was for me validating the fact that it was doing multi flooding so I could see different things happening like currently. So I kind of wanted to make sure this, like again, get this to the side project. We just test the viability of this framework. Um, so I wanted to see it happening. And here, product optimism yet again. Um, I thought this was valid, the, the substitutes. But, and the other thing is, if you read and run it multiple times, you're going to get different answers, which you know, you could ask financial analysts, same analyst five times and try to give you five answers. So we go. A 10 would be strong for the company in question. So in this case, it's saying that it's pretty low for the, the, the power of substitutive products is weighing on Exxon, all else equal. And so let's think about why might, that might be the case. Well, here we got renewable energy sources, electric vehicles, Wait. various fuels. You know, maybe that's feeding into the, the common thread that's out there. It's getting a lot of that. Uh, although, if you actually look at the numbers, global demand growth for oil has actually been supplied in the upside, not seeing the vehicles. So, maybe this is a case where the language on the internet is now pushing this lower than the number of mice in there. It should. So, maybe you don't want to find the number because we have this out. Yeah, interesting. On the online chat, I mean, online yep. as well. NVIDIA, yeah, we run that in there. Um, new entrants, this is strong for Exxon is in the sense that um, hard for new entrants to make inroads. Very strong position. I, I will say, like, yeah, it's a very capital intensive bid. These are billion dollar projects. Well, they, yeah, and it takes, um, there are some oil projects that are still under development that um, were on the drawing board when I started this business over 20 years ago. You know, already. So it tells you the length of time involved in some of these. So that was a bit quick. I have not added the check. There's a validation check that should check if something's NVDS would be equal. Let's see. NVDA. Thank you. All right. 
uh, stashed out. Yeah, I haven't guessed it, right? It's so, yeah. like, it's like, it's there. It's there. <laughs> it would feel like a good trap on myself by now. So, what are the, so you spent, obviously, you spent 25 years, 20 plus years learning how to use software to replace analysts or augment analysts. And you spent the last day and a half evaluating whether um, leg graph as a framework would be valid for some of those use cases. What's uh, your take so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I think lane graph, lane graph itself is just a, it's a very small tool um, relative to uh, it's not going to make us new eyes. I will not. <laughs> it's not going to make us recent eyes. There you go. Maybe uh, maybe the the substitutes ought to be coming down here with other products. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Back to the question. I think for me, it's a good tool for workflow orchestration. Inside. Works in magentic patterns, I think. Um, or, I don't know how to really extrapolate much further than that. Oh, it's like, is it one of those where you're now getting into the opportunity where you can start picking, putting data together and stepping escape? Yeah, well, that's what I'm, that's the big picture of the whole, the whole shebang is to get, like when it fit this all in the big system. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, there's, they're already machine learning. Yeah. 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 There's things that, and that people, people are biased. And that's where that's where you can you can play against it. Uh, you know, quant quant people have been doing this for a long time, playing like playing against human biases. So basically, you'll get run over on the trading. You know, they'll, they'll, the momentum trades will run you over the algorithms and stuff. So you just have to be you know when you're when you're trading on sentiment, which the individual investors can certainly do, but um, your big time hedge fund manager, they're not necessarily being your right. And uh, so the computers can get them. Quite offer that, and that's true irrespective of the bell and if you know, so which, which more do I get talking to? Well, the, I was speaking of the long term capability of no, I'm what, great. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, anthropic. I've, I've done, by the way, I've done with this structured data output. You know, I, I started off being a big user of, of OpenAI and GPT, and GPT 4 had a big step up for data, that structured data parsing relative to 3.5. I found there were times where 3.5 just hit its limits. Like it could get it a little better, better, better. And then you add one little tweak, and all of a sudden the thing regresses like five steps. And it wouldn't even parse in JSON. It was just like it'd give you nothing all of a sudden. Yeah. Maybe like uh, ad nauseum repeat character kind of stuff. You saw that about the but uh, but GPT four O seemed to fix that to a certain extent. However, what I found when I did my little bake off of GPT four O versus Anthropic three point five Sonnet, by the way, where it finally sort of leapfrogged over that was three point five Sonnet on Anthropic seemed to be much better, much more careful about following instructions. So for me, I'm being very precise in what I wanted to extract and do. I don't want you stepping out of the box. I want I don't want you, you know, uh, hallucinating. I want you just follow exactly to a T what you're doing here. Um, and what I was finding happening when I did the bake off was GPT 4.0. I had to add an extra uh, validation fix step. So when when uh, Kareem was talking about how you can get the raw data output, even if it didn't conform and it did fail validation for Bidantic, you could still get the raw what it looked like. I would take that, pass it back through, and have to get it to fix its own error, right? Mm -hmm. I had to build that whole step in just for GPT-4.0. It's almost like I just dropped that step out when I went to control. It's not even in this, by the way, this the side project. Jeff, that's uh, Facebook thing. That I haven't tested those in this case. Um, my experience, the walls. My experience, all the post platforms is that they are worse than GPT-2, which in turn, if we're both saying, I find that for the games, seems to strike the best balance between quality and response. It's why yes, we did on the time. But I'd be anxious to be like, well, if you're trying to work, you try to get out. But I did not invest. Yeah. 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 There, there, there you go. go. There you go. So, you know what? It's just like sweet. Jimmy. Jimmy. But sometimes it's just, if, but again, it's no. Oh, it's not an awesome way to. Uh, yeah, maybe it's, uh, maybe it is. I want to sell it. Oh. Um, yes, 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 y
uh, land graph or why is there would... something that you can do with land graph that you can only do with land graph and not you know, uh, you know Jarvis, uh, but I think. And the answer is there's nothing that you can do in land graph that you can't do with that you know, this Python. And, that, and um, uh, Rob has my you know experience time change together, you know, uh, preparing this workflow in Python for itself, doing the handoffs and doing those pipelines. Um, I found one potential benefit of where, where land graph, you know, area where land graph might shine. Um, and almost discovered that through this collaboration exercise is I, I gave, I you know, basically we had a discussion on how to do it and a meeting at, because I had a little bit more familiarity with land graph. I was, in, I, I was able to put together the, the workflow in land graph and it over to you and you were able to fill in the, uh, uh, the pieces and improve it from there. Uh, it reminded me of, uh, you know, sort of like a school assignment, you know, team assignment that I was part of where I handed the, uh, you know, focus C++ project. I and handed, I, I and essentially created error files and handed them over to my team and they were able to put, um, fill it in. You were, but because each node is, you know, each is an individual unit of work, each in an isolation, because you have the state uh, structure that has to conform to. So you know what the data is coming in, the, and you can ask them to send the same data. Uh, structure out. You each lady of the work uh, and as a, you know, have different team members work on because now they're working and hanging. It makes each of each of those nodes independently tested. Nodes. So I mean, here's what this is what I get green. Nodes. Um, nodes. Said, yeah, I said, hey, let's uh, explain what we wanted to accomplish, right? And then green gave that, and you. Essentially, I think what I had in here, you, yeah, you, you actually this is pretty much what Kareem came back to me with. These were all, I want to say, empty. Basically, it's all connected and basically said, all right, here's this is the um, the laying the graph equivalent of what I gave you, right? Yeah. And then I came in and I built it the logic behind each of the pieces. Right. Okay. So, yeah, it worked. Very to your point. And I, yeah. We were able to pass it back and forth pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one thing that it's, it might not be easy to appreciate in this graph uh, is there's a few different things happening. So we have conditional uh, routing with, uh, you know, those dotted lines that you see. So popular com uh, company info, it's not doing anything. It's RS. Yeah. Is it it's all more people learning? No, it's, it's actually, I don't know. It's living. Yeah. Start, you know, it's, it's sending, it's doing the calculate current premium independently of this estimate target graph, but then that's a subgraph in it. So we have a subgraph and inside subgraph, there's parallelization happening as well. And then, you know, like uh, Rob mentioned, he has to then accumulate all of those in, in the right fashion that's happening inside the estimate target premium. Send the, take that out or combine that, if the, you know, uh, compare that to calculate pre, uh, premium, do a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, um, accumulation over there. So, uh, a few different sort of uh, design patterns are sort of on, you know, on show. With an entire native like little thing, like when you write, when you're doing this in the, the line graph, it's like you write the function for the uh, for the edge, and then you have to base find where you correct one to the node, and then you write another one that goes to the edge. Oh, the next one. So it's like, whereas if I'm just Finding another function that might have been a placeholder, okay. just and I think that's I think that's a placeholder for adding the area where I use it and crash the node just said, like dummy dummy that no work word. Why why are so, why are some dotted and some solid? I think the dotted is where it breaks. No, I think is that where it branches, but that's not true, is it? You should be conditional star dotted, but yeah, that may just have been because it's an additional parameter that's been specified that um I yeah conditional that's yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, but in this case, it wasn't conditional. You we needed to do both of those in parallel. It's working as expected. It's just uh, the diagramming uh, relies on. I actually, did. I think it is. Now that I think about it, I think it is. A, it's a conditional. It is a cool thing because it's both conditional and it forks. Mm -hmm. Because basically, if it's not in the S and P, it was go this route. It's like right. the whole thing. If it was in the S and P, it switched into parallelization, where mm -hmm. it would a premium at the same time it kicked off all the core like, force. And then it would pull back, pull it back together at the end. So yes, it is conditional. I will mention parallelism and as far as I go, and I'm not I'm a C plus plus guy. Uh, not a, not that Python can't do anything in parallel. 
it's like JavaScript. It doesn't do things in parallel. It's all the straight line stuff. It's all my own. It's a good question. And, I, and I'll acknowledge I've got limits in my... You're correct. Yes. But there there are ways to handle parallel. You said you could do it. You said you were able to. I think it's like it basically the next step. Well, you have to put a lot more water break code to make that happen. It's not that you can't do them, well, uh, but I think in parallelization, you yeah. I think this is a lot more tedious word. I have I- asynchronous calls that are about basically killing all the wait time now. You know, so like spreading it out so that you're executing things and while you're waiting, you're waiting on like five different things. Is different. Wait, wait, yeah. 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 Here's some your crowd. They said that. It's a bad ingredient. Yes, yeah, there's no circular. That's one of the reasons I was kind of somewhat indifferent about it's a really necessary privilege. But I will say some of the error handling stuff is where I would probably add certain to it, where if it, if it failed validation, pass it back through. And probably to avoid the $500 agent problem, I will have a limit of the retrust this um, that I'll build in. But that's where in the production version of this kind of stuff, I have those found, which is more. I think uh, one of the Use cases for running back. It's, it's a circular thing. So like, I think a tag is pretty easy. Yeah. Um, but the, the other side of the insight, we have, I think our studio, a lot of units are like, it's an ad here, a very long region, where you just want it. So the box is a certain point. That's the, that's the important reason. I really want to agree into that. I absolutely, because the, uh, I was trying to do that manually, and the guy, the, this, the, uh, the checkpointing feature, right? So basically, you know, if you, now and I'm recording not just the entire state, but the state as it was here, 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 here. And I've got all these copies of the state. And even after the whole thing's done, I can go back to after the one you know, and I can start to step through it without having to repeat all the LLM calls, right? So if I can envisioning something where it's quite expensive, I've gone through a whole lot of stuff. And I'm at like step, maybe not at the very end, but even in the middle somewhere, I've got to refine my prop or something. And I can just pick up that state right from there, right? And then replay that piece. I quite like that feature. The only problem that I'm struggling with is I got to get familiar with the syntax. I'm like getting, we are calling the LW in code right now. I love the idea of a visual interface to that, where I'm assuming that's a lot of what's hosted in like Black Cloud. And so, if you have this, I think there are bodies on it. Uh, but this, you know, it's like all the different things say like make modifications to the parts. In the studio, and it was like here. So that I'm going to have to borrow this map. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I want to be calling time. It's nine three. We have the patio, which we can hang out and continue through the night. We we do have people. Sure. That, uh, I want to do this, Kareem, and it is awesome. Uh, awesome talk. Uh, I learned so much about uh, code generation and GitHub integration. Uh, Kareem for share, continuing to share your journey through two call, tool calling extension extending these local models. Um, and Rob, thank you so much for giving us a viewpoint into, you know, uh, obviously your wealth of experience in financial analysis and the software side of it. Uh, and both you two for uh, collaborating on a, a day and a half um, to really show this rapid pro- rapid prototyping capabilities um, that we can really, that we can start to um, start to see as we build our, our agents terms to support our day-to-day activities. So thank you so much. Oh, and Ricky and Ricky as well. Yes, thank you.